Have you seen the rioting in France? Apparently, France has deployed 45,000 troops and armored vehicles and other equipment to quell a riot. The riot happened because earlier this week on Tuesday, a young man named Nahel, a French teenager in the suburb of Paris at a place called Nanterre, was driving along and he was stopped by the police officers. Well, Nahel is only 17 years old and apparently in France you can't get a driver's license at 17. So rather than be arrested, he decided to drive away and one of the police officers shot and killed him. And the whole thing was captured on tape. Well, this has sparked a riot in France, a huge riot in France. There's a deep history and distrust between the Arab population in France and the rest of the French people. And sometimes this comes to a head in rioting. Sometimes there's police problems. Sometimes there's neighborhood problems. And there's basically distrust between the both sides. And you have to ask yourself, why would you riot, though? When you riot, People are hurt. Lives are destroyed. Property's destroyed. All this energy that could be used to make France a better place is now all of a sudden pointed inward, and they're going to destroy each other. And if it's unchecked, rioting can lead to war. And once war happens, well, war is like a divorce. Once you've set your sights to say, we're going to war with the one another, it's like there's no chance for reconciliation. We're now at each other's throats, and nobody's going to be happy until one or the other side wins. War is ugly, war is deadly, and war is the ultimate thing that can happen anytime that there's a riot. Now, one of the primary jobs of any government is to keep the people peaceful, to keep them from rioting. Because we all know that rioting cannot end well. So a good leader, a good politician, if you will, will try as much as possible to bring both sides to the table, to listen to grievances, to talk about what it is that you're writing about? Is there something that can be done? As long as you can keep people at the table to talk, then maybe they won't riot. And so a good government is always reaching out, trying to find ways to bring people together. Because once you riot, it could lead to war. And once it's war, really nobody wins. It's deadly, it's destructive, It creates winners and losers. And yet, anytime there's a riot, you wonder if it will end in war. Now, what's interesting is today is July 2nd. And this is the day in history that the United States celebrates our signing of the Declaration of Independence back in 1776, 247 years ago. These Men gathered together in this room, and they declared a riot against King George. Actually, I think they declared a war against King George, at least a riot. And on this day, we celebrate that actually in our past, there was a riot and a war that gained our freedom. So while riots and war are horrible, we know that at some level, sometimes they're necessary. So what does a Christian do? If a Christian follows Jesus and listens to the words of Jesus and riots begin or wars begin, how are we supposed to navigate this? How are we supposed to know what Jesus wants us to do? What are we supposed to do? How could we come together as a Christian nation and figure this out? Well, we're in a sermon series called Making Loving Disciples. And this is a short series talking about the discipleship life cycle. You plant the seeds, they grow, and then they bear fruit. And then in the fruit are more seeds. And we've been talking over the past few weeks about what bearing fruit looks like. And because today is July 2nd, because we're going into the 4th of July four-day weekend, 
I thought it might be good for us just to stop and pause for a moment and say, what is a Christian's obligation in the nation? What are we supposed to do? I'm a, I want to follow Jesus, but I'm also a citizen of my country. What would Jesus want me to do? How do I navigate this? Well, to answer that question, we're going to look at a very, very famous instance of Jesus. And this happens in all the Gospels, uh, all, the, all the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, and it's the story that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. We're going to look at the passage from Matthew. And we're just going to read the whole thing, this passage, and then we're going to comment on it. So this is Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him, and they went away. It's probably helpful to just give a brief history of this time that Jesus is living in. It was a tumultuous time. It was a very tense time. It was a lot like the way the world exists now. There were a lot of politicians doing crazy things, a lot of people doing crazy things, and the tension was very, very high. Um, and, a, and a lot of this tension was actually centered around this coin, this coin of Caesars called a denarius. Now, a denarius is worth one day's labor. If you work today at kind of a minimum wage job, then your pay for that day would be a denarius. This was a coin that was manufactured by the Roman Empire. All the Caesars put their image on this coin. And you wouldn't think that that would be a problem. But there was a problem. Um, and the problem is, is that this coin was what Jesus called the payment for the imperial tax. Now, what was the imperial tax? Well, you remember from the birth of Jesus and it's recorded in Luke chapter 2, that uh, it came to pass in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this decree happened when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, this was the first census that Caesar did. And he went and he figured out how many people were in his empire. Now, why did he do that? Because later on, not a few years too far from now, when Jesus, when uh, when Caesar did this, this census, Caesar implemented a poll tax. It's a head tax. It's the imperial tax. The tax that Caesar implemented was a brand new tax, and unlike other other taxes, it was a tax that each person in the empire had to pay. It was a head tax. You couldn't get away from it. Now there were other taxes in the Roman Empire. There were taxes on goods, taxes on movement, taxes on roads, taxes entering the city, taxes entering the city, taxes to try to get things done in government. There were taxes everywhere. But this tax was different. This was a tax that was universal that you could not avoid. If you were required to pay this tax, you had to pay this tax. It could happen to rich, it could happen to poor, it could happen to people who are sick, people who are well. Anybody, it didn't matter who you were. It mattered that you had to pay this tax. Well, after this tax happened, there was a revolt. There were so many people angry about this tax that they revolted against Caesar. And Caesar was able to squash this revolt, but it came at a high price. And the high price was people didn't trust each other. People were angry with each other. The people in Jerusalem were now 
more angry with Caesar. They were more angry with the Roman government. And the tensions were very, very high because of this. And those tensions continued even to the time of Jesus. So Jesus says to these people, show me the coin. And they immediately knew that Jesus was going to talk about this imperial tax. And they knew that a revolt was possible, that a riot was possible, that an insurrection was possible, that a revolution was possible. But we get some more details in this story because who comes to Jesus? Normally you see the, fad, the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the teachers of the law, but this time you see the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, who were the Pharisees and the Herodians? Well, the Pharisees obviously were the religious people at the time, like the Sadducees, they were there in Jerusalem, but the Herodians, these were people that were friendly to Herod, and and Herod was friendly to Rome. So here are these people coming to Jesus, are the Pharisees and the Herodians. They're on two opposite sides of one particular issue, and the one particular issue is this, should we pay taxes to Caesar Or should we not pay taxes to Caesar? Because not only was this a head tax, but it was also an image engraved on this tax that had the picture of Caesar. And it really, really made the Jews angry that they had to pay this tax with a coin that had the image of Caesar on it. And they wanted to know, okay, there's a riot coming. There's a revolution coming. There's an insurrection coming. What side of the insurrection are you on? Are you on the side of the Pharisees? That means that we should revolt and we shouldn't pay this tax. We should not be friendly to Rome. Or are you on the side of the Herodians that says, listen, at least they're keeping the peace. At least we're all living together in harmony. I know it's a price to pay, but it's a small price to pay to be in the Roman Empire and to have peace. Are we going to follow peace through not taxation? Or are we going to follow peace even though there's taxation? Or are we going to riot and then destroy the whole thing? And that was the question they came up to Jesus. That's why these two people came to Jesus. They wanted to know what side he is on. And so Jesus asks him, he says, well, take out a coin. He says, whose picture on the coin is it? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. And Jesus gives probably the most profound answer to any political question that's ever been asked. He says this, he says, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and render to God that which is God. In this question about what side are you going to come on, Jesus answered with this, he said, listen, don't take sides. Give to God the things that are God's and give to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's. Jesus is saying that he came with a new kingdom. When Jesus came on this earth, he said to him, the kingdom of God is near. And the thing about the kingdom of God is it is not based upon a kingdom of this earth. It's a kingdom of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a kingdom where we place our allegiance to Jesus. It's not a kingdom that's ever going to go away. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're in this kingdom. You are his. It is not a kingdom of material things. It's not a kingdom of power. It's guided by his word, and it's empowered by his Holy Spirit. And we are in this kingdom for a reason. And the reason why Jesus puts us in the kingdom is to be an ambassador for him. Because the natural condition of the world is that we fight, we argue, we riot. Sometimes we war, sometimes we kill. It's in our human nature to do these things. And the only antidote to these things is the kingdom of God. If you are in the kingdom of God, you've been called by God to use whatever resources you have, your hands, your feet, and everything to try to be a peacemaker, to try to be part of the equation that doesn't riot, part of the equation that doesn't overthrow. Now, I know that sometimes in our history, we've been part of the riot. We've been part of the wars. And we know that that's part of the human condition also. 
So while we try to not war, while we try not to riot, we know that at some times, because of injustices or whatever happens in the world, we have to riot. So what is a Christian going to do? That, my friends, is the $100 million question. What does a Christian do? If you are a follower of Jesus and you live on this earth and the earth is prone to rioting and war and dissension, what has God called you to do in your particular situation? And the answer is, it's complicated. It's really complicated. There are no right solutions. There are no wrong solutions. There's just the human condition and the kingdom of God fighting against that human condition. But I said at the beginning, what is it that Jesus wants you to do? What are some real tangible things that Jesus has called us as Christians to do as we navigate this whole thing, as we live in the kingdom, as we live in the world? And I can only come up with about three things, and I just want to briefly talk about what those are. The first one is this, be in love with the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. So no matter what, as much as it depends on you, always speak the truth. And not only speak the truth, but be in love with the truth. If you see something that is not truthful, make sure you point it out that it is not truthful. If you see something where, where the truth is being hidden, reveal the truth. Bring the light of the truth to the situation. The truth is always good because Jesus is the truth. The only way that two parties can come together is to put away all the politicking and speak truth. Who is it that said, you may, be, um, you may be entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own truth? Well, my friends, there's a lot of truth in that. Get to the truth. See if you can find out what the truth is. And a corollary to that is be against corruption. Don't let people lie and spread lies for their own ends and their own means. Root out those things, find the truth, put an end to corruption. As much as it depends upon you, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're living in the kingdom of God, you should be a love in love with the truth. But the other thing you need to know is this. Nobody speaks the truth well and all people are corrupt. There is nobody on this world that lives an uncorrupted life. If you are in the human condition, if you live on this world, you at some level are corrupted. What does that mean? It means that the people that you're following, at some level, they're corrupt too. You may love them, you may follow them to the end of the world, you might even give your life to die for them, but you need to understand that at some level, they are also corrupt. There is no perfect leader, there is no perfect politician, there's no perfect cause except for the cause of Jesus. All the causes of this earth at some level are corrupted causes. And so you, as you're navigating this world, need to understand that as much as you want to be a part of a movement, and it is perfectly okay to be a part of a movement. You can be on any political aisle. You can be on any side of the issue. I mean, as long as it's not against God's word. But all these things, it's okay to join movements to be a part of it, but understand that at its root, there's corruption there. I mean, everyone has an agenda. Everyone that tells you that I don't have an agenda, I guarantee you they have an agenda. I think of uh, the movie White Christmas, right? And you've got Bob Wallace and Betty Hayford or Halen or whatever, and um, they, they've kind of written this letter to Bob Wallace. It's these two sisters, the 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 sisters and they come together because uh, they want to meet Bob Wallace and they want to become famous singers. And so they, they write a letter under false pretenses and they finally get face to face with them. And Betty says, listen, I have to tell you right off the bat that this letter that was written from Benny, it really wasn't read or written from Benny. It was written from my sister. She's just trying to get in front of us because she, he wants, uh, she wants you to see our act because we have a pretty good act. And he says, oh, don't worry about it. Everybody's got an angle. And she takes offense at it. She goes, I don't have an angle. And that's a pretty cynical thing to say that everybody has an angle. And, and Bob was like, yeah, but you have an angle. This, your sister wants to be on TV. Like everybody has an agenda. Everybody has an angle. And that, you know, that's part of the, one of the, the 
points of contention in the early on, but it's true. Everybody has an angle. And to think that nobody has an angle, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you because everybody has an agenda. Everybody has an angle and everybody is corrupt. There is no perfect, uncorrupted organization, party, group, movement. Everybody's corrupt. And the more that you know that, the more you can navigate the things of this world. So don't, don't believe that your party is perfect or that your movement is perfect or that your issue is perfect because everybody's corrupted. And this is probably, the third thing is probably the most important thing. And that's this. We don't know what's going to happen with any riot, okay? We don't know where it leads to. We don't know how many people are harmed, how, how many businesses are destroyed, how many things are, are put that are broken like Humpty Dumpty, right? They're broken. They can't be put back together again. So as much as it depends upon you, if you're living in the kingdom, be a peacemaker. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. If you see people arguing, be a peacemaker. Step up and try to see if you can navigate to find the truth and to let the truth do what the truth does, which always, when the truth is revealed, it's the only time where peace can actually be brought forward. It's when the truth is revealed. I mean, that's the story of every Hallmark movie, right? An argument between two people and they both have a piece of the truth but not the whole truth and eventually the whole truth is found out and they can come back together again and live happily ever after because the truth comes out. As far as possible as it relies upon you, be a peacemaker. Try to use the gifts that God's given to you to be a peacemaker. And, you know, you could do that as an organization. You could do that as a, you know, all sorts of different ways. But I'm talking about you personally. The people in your life that are different from you, that believe things different from you, that, that, uh, that you're angry with, that, that you don't think have the, have the truth with them, reach out to them. Even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, sit down with them. See if you can come to a common truth. See if you can bring peace between people, between you and other people. Peace is the goal of the kingdom. We are God's peacemakers. We're called to try to fight against the evil and the corruption and the warring things that we have in this world because this world is corrupted. It has lots of problems. And I think some days, I think what riot is going to happen that's going to lead to a war and what war is going to happen that leads to the final war? where everything's destroyed. And so as much as it depends upon you, stop it before it turns into a riot. Stop it before it turns into a war. If as much as it depends upon you, you can bring peace. Peace is always better than war. But sometimes wars are inevitable. Sometimes as much as you try to bring peace to an, or to an organization or to a situation, the war is inevitable. And I do think that sometimes wars are inevitable. But here's the good news. All the kingdoms, all the wars, all the factions, all the riots, all those things are just part of this kingdom of earth. But because you are a follower of Jesus Christ, because he's loved you and he's bought you and he's purchased you, your kingdom that you're in, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that kingdom lasts forever. So we have this rioting in France, right? 45,000 troops. You just never know. Is this going to be the end of the government that's there now? Is a new government going to pop up? Is this riot going to lead to larger riots and more riots within the European hemisphere? And will that lead to a world war? Will that lead to the end of all humanity? You just never know the answer to this. Any little infraction can turn into something massive, maybe even massive enough to destroy all of humanity. But Jesus loves you. And he died for you, and he bought you, and he purchased you, and he grabs a hold of you. No matter what happens on this earth, he'll never let go. And while you're holding on to Jesus, he calls you to use that relationship to bring as much love and peace to the world around you as you can. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, on this day leading up to 4th of July, we thank you that you continue to guide and direct us. We pray, Lord, you would guide all of our 
leaders in our nation. Um, and now the nations across the world, be with all rioting and war, be present. But Lord, we most of all thank you that you sent your son to protect us from the ultimate war and to lead us safely into your arms. In his name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May you have a great 4th of July. Uh, enjoy whatever you're going to enjoy for those days. Um, pray for our nation. Pray for our country. Pray for our leaders and leaders all around the world. But give God thanks for the safety and security that we enjoy, which is very rare in human history. Until then, we'll see you next week. Go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.